All right, so boom. First and foremost, shout out to Vice um, for the dark side of the ring, Benoit. Both parts, because I must say, without question, of all the Benoit documentaries I have ever seen, nothing hit as hard as this one. I'm talking about I went through all of the emotions, from pure elation to hearing about his ascension to the top, and then absolute devastation when the tragedy hit and the fallout of the tragedy. Now, I knew a good percentage of the details that they, you know, uh, uh, documented in the documentary, but there were some that were able to give me some of the closure that I needed to not necessarily close the chapter of the Benoit story, but I'm at least approaching the ending of how I feel about the situation. I first want to point out if there are two individuals in this entire documentary and on this world who deserve the biggest hug. It is one, uh, Benoit's sister-in-law, Sandra, and Benoit's son, David. Because those two, to sit through the documentary and speak and relive that horrific weekend and everything that led up to it, having to go through all of the emotions, that takes some strength. So I just want to send out my most sincerest condolences for the losses that you guys had to deal with. But more importantly, I wanted to give you guys the biggest hug, if I, I can't give it to you physically, so virtually, get up in here, the biggest hug for the strength that you guys displayed through this documentary. And you can see the shirt that I'm wearing. It's, it's well documented up until this point. Benoit is my favorite wrestler of all time. Now, they, you have your Undertakers, you have your Shawn Michaels, you have your Steve Austins, you have The Rock, Triple H, Ric Flair, all of the Four Horsemen, Kane, all of these guys who are out there. Nobody, nobody touched me the way Benoit did when I saw him in the ring because this was a master of his craft. We could talk about characters. I have top characters, but when it comes to pure wrestlers, nobody came close to how good Benoit was. And watching the documentary, you see the commitment this man made to his craft. And more importantly, the discipline. Chris Jericho touched on a situation where I believe they were in Japan correct me if I'm wrong in the comments, and there was, I believe, a maneuver that was done wrong. Now, it's not as if this match was on TV, as if this match was on pay-per-view. It's just a regular match between the two of them in front of whatever audience they happen to be in front of. Benoit messed up on a certain maneuver. Most wrestlers and most professionals, let's just be honest, in all aspects of professions would have just said, ah, you know what, I messed up, cool, I'll get it back the next time. Benoit did 500 squats in an effort to discipline himself. I see my conduit with that because, as I said to kick off the year, I was going to have five tasks that I have to accomplish throughout the day. If I do not accomplish them, I gotta do push-ups because it has to be some form of self-discipline. This is somebody who dedicated his entire life to perfecting his craft. The downside of that was the dedication that he put towards perfecting his craft and the willingness to do whatever it took to perfect it ultimately became his downfall as they also touched on the detriment of the flying headbutt and what it does to your body. Harley Race invented it. This man has back issues up until his death. I believe he died last year, if I'm not mistaken. Then he passed it on to the Dynamite Kid. He told the Dynamite Kid, hey man, don't do this maneuver. It's gonna mess you up. Dynamite Kid said, word. And then now, he's in a wheelchair. Dynamite Kid went over and told Benoit, hey man, it's not a good move to do it. I should have listened to Harley Race. She don't go out there and do the Diamond Head, but Benoit said, word. And now, he's in the upper room, okay? But, you saw somebody who wanted to go out there and put on the best performance possible, and then ultimately became his downfall. I wanna point out a few things in the documentary that really caught my attention. Chris Nowitzki, who used to be a wrestler in the WWE, turned, you know, a, a, a doctor 
preferably in the brain, or I should say uh, specifically, uh, a brain doctor, a neurologist, neurosurgeon, whatever they call it. Somebody let me know in the comment section. But he recalls sitting down with Benoit six months prior to the tragedy where Benoit called him over and said, hey, I heard you were writing a book on concussions. Can you tell me some information? How many concussions have you had? Nowitzki responded and said, I've had six that I can remember, but I'm sure there have been much more. Hey, Benoit, how much have you had? Benoit said, well, that's too, I've had too much to count, but here's my number, and we can chat at a later time. Nowitzki called him about a week later. Benoit was having a little bit of a dispute where he seemed agitated so they could not speak at that particular time because Benoit said hey um, now's not a good time I'll speak to you later we haven't found out at least Nowitzki didn't touch on it in the documentary whether they spoke ever again but it's to be assumed they did not one has to wonder what Benoit's concern was here if you were to connect the dots and you sit down and you reach out to somebody who does your same profession and now specializes in a field that you happen to have issues with, one would say Benoit was concerned, and I would say the same. So this is somebody who understood the reality of his situation, like, wait a minute, there's an issue here. Let me find out some information about it, but ultimately he could not. So that gives me a check mark in the closer section regarding Benoit's, you know, mentality, because he recognized perhaps something was wrong. Now, what could the catalyst of things being wrong, or I should say, what could the catalyst of him being concerned that something is going wrong um, be? That could all stem from the death of his best friend, that being Eddie Guerrero, also one of my favorite wrestlers growing up. Eddie was beloved by everybody, and him, just like Benoit, two individuals, you could not find a single person on the planet who had something negative to say about them. They were revered by not only their peers, by the fans, by damn near everybody. I have yet to hear somebody say, man, Eddie Guerrero is such a douchebag. Never heard it. Up until Benoit died, never heard any sort of words of, uh, 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 of like Machiavellian intent, okay, unscrupulous action from Benoit, this, 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 about Benoit, I should say, this never happened. But the passing of Eddie did something to Benoit. You heard Vicky Guerrero talk about it, where Nancy called Vicky and said, well, Benoit's crying again. Chris is crying uncontrollably again. That she talked about there was times in which after Eddie's death, you saw Benoit go over to Eddie's old house. While Nancy was consoling, Nancy Benoit, that is, consoling Vicky Guerrero, Benoit went to Eddie's room, slept on his side of the bed, held his pillow, and cried for hours. This makes me question heartbreak and the severity that it has on somebody. Because we can all see somebody deal with a tremendous loss, mourn, and then not necessarily get over it in a sense to make it seem as if it's black and white like oh, I'm over it and live the rest of my life but they can almost return back to normal but everybody deals with loss different one has to wonder how much Eddie meant to Benoit you could look at it like this some people can say well he meant everything there are best friends and then there's a higher level this is damn near his brother okay because look at it like this they both worked the same pro profession. They both had the same passion, okay, for that profession. And they were both perfections. And to make matters worse, they, they were at the hip. You didn't see Eddie and didn't see Benoit. You didn't see Benoit and didn't see Eddie. Okay, so so this this was, he was closer to Eddie in a sense than he was his wife. And people would say, well, you know, if you're married, you're supposed to be able to say everything to your wife. You're supposed to, you know, be able to be transparent about all of your emotions with your wife and everything. But it's a little bit of a difference. Eddie and Benoit did the exact same thing regarding their profession, so they understood each other. Although Nancy Benoit worked in the industry and was damn good at it, I might add, she wasn't taking those bumps. She wasn't putting on matches. 
She didn't have the pressure of having to go out there and uphold the prestige of a champion. She didn't have to go out here and, and put on for thousands and millions of fans the way that Eddie and Benoit did. So they both would understand each other much better than his spouse ever could. And that's not to chastise her. It's just a reality of the situation. So when you look at the fallout of Eddie's death on Benoit, you cannot act as if, well, he wasn't somebody who was not mentally in the right state. And with, at the time, regarding CTE, it wasn't taken as seriously as now. It's not as if when somebody had a concussion, you know, they were rushing you and, and making sure no, no more matches, you're not fighting anymore, we're gonna make sure you're in the hospital getting the treatment you deserve. Oh no, Chris Jericho talked about it in the documentary. It was, taking a, a chair shot unprotected to the head was like a badge of honor. So if you had a, you have a, a, a concussion, well big whoop, we all got concussions. Shavo said something that was very poignant in the documentary as well, saying, hey man, everybody probably got CTE. Just what is the level that all of us have? And it really brings concern because Chavo Guerrero dealing with the loss of his uncle and Eddie and one of his closest friends in Benoit, one has to wonder what his mental state is. Is he ever going to snap? And he was still wrestling up until, if I'm not mistaken, two years ago I remember he was still wrestling. So at what point are we going to get an opportunity to see, not, not to say his downfall and his tragedy, but what's going on in his mental state? He seems to be fine right now, but you never know whenever things are dealing with the brain. So it's a very unfortunate sort of situation. And I've heard a lot of people talk about Hall of Fame regarding Chris Benoit, and me being the biggest, one of the biggest Benoit fans out here, I still say, no, they shouldn't put him in the Hall of Fame. And that's not to say, well, his legacy doesn't, you know, uh, 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 it, it doesn't match up to those of Hall of Famers. No, not at all, but you, you can't, in a, professionally, you can't put him in because the personal life can't be separated for a large celebration of somebody's body of work. You can't ignore it, so it's impossible to put him in. And that would go across all sports. But OJ killed his wife, and he's in the Hall of Fame. OJ was already in at the time of the murder. Two, he got off and was innocent, regardless of the fact that we all, we, we all know he pretty much did it but you can't now take him out he was already in best case scenario would be somebody like a uh, Darren Sharper one of the greatest safeties in NFL history you cannot talk about the best safeties in the game and not mention Darren Sharper however he was a serial rapist and he got caught, I believe, two years after he retired. So he only had to wait about three years, and maybe he could have gotten to the Hall of Fame. He would have been a first battle Hall of Famer. But because he ended up getting caught, and now he's serving prison, rightfully so, he'll never be able to get into the Hall of Fame. Because you cannot separate the two. Personally, you can. That's what I've been able to accept. I can separate somebody's professional life or I should say their profession, from their personal life. I'm not going to chastise Benoit's entire life for that final weekend. I refuse to do it. Because I, I, I have to acknowledge what led up to that point. The loss that was going on in his brain. The, 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 the inability to compute certain sort of things. Given the diagnosis regarding his brain, they said he had, an 85, he had the brain of an 85-year-old man who had Alzheimer's. He had one of the worst cases of CTE. Who's to say he was in the right state of mind up until the time of the murders? Regardless of the fact that he was cognizant enough to search the day before, hey, what's the quickest way to break a neck? What are these scriptures here? Leaving like a suicide note with the certain sort of scriptures that he was looking for. But at the same time, was he in the right state of mind while doing that? We'll never know. It's all pure speculation. It's like putting together a pieces of the puzzle, but the final piece is no longer there. It was swallowed by the person who made the puzzle, and now they're dead. So we'll never ultimately know. People just have to come up with their, you know, the, the conclusions that they want to come up with. But 
all in all, this was a sensational documentary. And if you're a Benoit fan, you're an Eddie fan, you're a wrestling fan, this is the perfect thing to watch. And more importantly, with Benoit and this tragedy, it is the embodiment of it takes years to build up a reputation, but seconds to, to, to destroy it. Literally. Let's just say the tragedy never happened. And they said Benoit would have died within eight months if he did not kill himself. He would have ended up dying anyway. Let's just say he were to have died without the tragedy. He would have been in the Hall of Fame, regarded as prop one of the greatest wrestlers of all time. He was by far, in my opinion, by far the best technical wrestler of all time. Sorry Kurt Angle, sorry Chris Jericho, sorry Bret Hart, sorry Daniel Bryan, sorry Dean Malenko, sorry all these guys. Without, in my opinion, Benoit was the best technical wrestler of all time. His legacy would have been completely different. Completely different, but unfortunately, that's not the case. And to close out the documentary, they said something regarding him and Eddie, where it was like the two best of friends, now deceased. And when you look back at it, Eddie is revered, uplifted, honored, and world-renowned as one of the greatest of all time, and constantly acknowledged. Benoit, who wanted nothing more than the respect of his peers, is now erased, never to be talked about, considered like the child of Satan. You can't even mention this man. And if he knew this would be his fate, it would have tore him apart. So that really makes me want, like, there's no way he would not have known this would have ended up being the fallout of his actions. Maybe, maybe I'm tripping, but Jericho said it best. Benoit fought his entire life for this profession, and that weekend, that tragedy, nearly destroyed what he loved so dearly. It, it was truly, it, it was truly a magnificent documentary. You guys gotta go and check it out. I, I've never been touched and moved emotionally by a documentary about Benoit like this one. Definitely worth watching. All of the kudos to Vice for putting this together. And it, it, it was magnificent from start to finish. It's only two parts, about 42 minutes a piece. So if you got yourself an hour and a half with a little bit more time to kill, I would definitely say go and uh, watch that. Although I wouldn't say kill is the best operative word here, but uh, of course it's definitely worth watching. Oh, and P.S. I remember Paul Heyman had an interview with uh, Inside the Ropes a few years back, and I remember somebody had screamed out Benoit or um, you know something regarding Benoit, and he ended up saying fuck Benoit. Uh, because only one person had to die in that house. He could have just killed himself, spared Nancy, spared Daniel, and everything else would have been fine. Which, in a sense, he is correct. Not even in a sense. He's absolutely right. Because Nancy did not have to die. Daniel did not have to die. Benoit could have killed himself, and they would have been able to live the rest of their lives. Not to say that they would have been happy, not at all. That's an extremely traumatic experience. It's kind of hard to carry on. Go on and ask the remaining member of the Von Erics. But um, it all co it goes back to the question I asked earlier regarding what was his mental state? Was it, oh, I feel as if I cannot live without these people? What his mind was already made up? All of these sort of questions that we'll never have the answer to. That is what makes the action so unforgivable. Because had he just killed himself, everybody would have been able to say, you know what, given the, the situation, the devastation that he had to deal with, given all of the problems that this brother had, if he took himself out, you know what, I forgive him for killing himself. But then the loss and the murder of his son and wife is what makes this so egregious. And that's what, you know, makes people unable to stomach 
the thought of any sort of praise going in his direction, rightfully so. But again, for me, it all comes down to the mental state. Not to say if somebody were to break into my house and kill my entire family, but they were suffering from mental issues, I'm supposed to just say, well, you know, they had a mental problem, so oh, I guess I could forgive them. It takes time to get over sort of, you know, situations like that. And hell, even if you don't forgive, that's your own prerogative. You should not be chastised for that at all. People who are upset at Benoit, rightfully so. People who forgive him, rightfully so. But what we shouldn't do is battle each other for each other, the opinion of what happened. Especially, as long as it's not an ignorant one, like, oh, who cares if he killed people? He's still the GOAT. No, don't, don't do that. Don't do that. But if we can have a conversation, truly have some dialogue about the situation, I would like to hear what your thoughts on the Benoit tragedy is and how do you feel about him and the legacy now given that it's been approaching 13 years since it's transpired. How much do you think he was going through and what could have possibly been going through his mind? And although it's an extremely touchy situation, if any of you guys have you know, dealt with suicide in your family or with your friends or things of that nature and trying to piece stuff together to try to understand what led to this point you can provide some insight and we can truly have a dialogue about this situation because I feel as if it's a very healthy conversation to have regardless of how many demons it brings back up because people need to be able to talk about things like this because this is stuff that is unseen. What's going on in the head, it's unseen until the actions that are done, you know, physically. If I was do battling all day long up here, you'd never know if I just sit here with a smile on my face. That was a terrible smile. I look as, as if I was heavily sedated, something was wrong. But if I spend my days like, everybody just assumes that I'm happy, but every single night, morning and afternoon, I'm going through mental battles, trying to keep myself together, and then I eventually snap, people would never know. So these are conversations we have to be able to have and let out, you know, whatever sort of issues that we got up here. If Benoit had somebody who he can confide in and talk to and get all of those emotions out, perhaps this could have been avoided. At the same time, with CTE, there's no sort of, you know, there's, there's no blueprint nor, you know, things written in paper to where you know what somebody's going to do. He was almost, he was pretty much patient zero, in a sense, regarding CTE on such a national sort of, sort of scale to where it, it became the, 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 the center of conversation. And we've seen multiple different cases where people were dealing with a, 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 a brain damage and they either killed themselves or maybe killed somebody else. But with Benoit, it was so, you know, publicized out there. He, he was almost like the first one. He changed the wellness policy for WWE and really wrestling across the board. So maybe with his, the, 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 the silver lining in a sense would be the change in how people approach brain injury. Although they changed the wellness policy in WWE after Eddie's death, after the death of Benoit, across the deck in everything, things change. So with every tragedy, there has to be at least a silver lining somewhere. You have to find it. For me, perhaps that's what it was. There had to be one. Unfortunately, it was him. But that's my thoughts on it. Let me know in the comment section what you guys thought of the documentary. If you haven't seen it, I'll link in the description below. Also, as a tag pin on uh, um, the, the, the pinned comment, I'll put both part one and two. Go and check that out. Come back here. Let's have a conversation in the comment section. Um, when I'm not treating after my pops, he's actually taking a nap right now. When I'm not treating after him, I'll get and hop into the comments and we can discuss. Uh, but yeah, let me know your thoughts. 
on uh, Chris Benoit. And uh, last but not least, just want to say uh, condolences once again to David Benoit and uh, Sandra, who's his uh, aunt. I cannot pronounce her last name is something with a T. I cannot pronounce it. But uh, rest in peace to Chris Benoit. Rest in peace to Nancy Benoit. Rest in peace to Daniel Benoit. And also, rest in peace to Eddie Guerrero. And I'd be remiss if I said Chris Benoit and I did not say Eddie Guerrero. And all individuals um, affected by this tragedy.